Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and we're testing out the GLINet KVM today. Well, I've actually been testing it for a few days, and I did have a conversation with my friend from Apple Large Adventures. You'll find his video linked down below, where he, well, completely shows the problems with this device as it was shipped to many other creators, including myself. The problem really came down to some firmware updates. And of course, don't buy things on the promise that the firmware will get better. Wait till the firmware is better. The firmware got better. That's good. Even though his video is only several days ago and it's currently April of 2025 still, uh, there's a big change in from the day I got it till the day it is today where it works properly with the new firmware, including some of the BIOS issues, the it doesn't like Linux issues. And uh, I also did some testing with the ATX connectors. This had a little bit of a bug in it. Once again, shout out to my friend at Apple Arts Adventures there for pointing out that there's a polarity that you need to follow on these. And you wouldn't think a power button that's just normally a momentary contact in your case has polarity, but it does. And I didn't really think about that. And it's not noted in our documentation, but I did email them and hopefully it will be in the future noted on our documentation to make sure you get the polarity right. So if you hook this up and the power switch or reset button doesn't work, flip them around. That's all you gotta do. So let's get started. Are you an individual or forward-thinking business seeking expert assistance with network engineering, storage, or virtualization projects? Maybe you're part of an internal IT team that needs to proactively manage, monitor, and secure your technology. We offer comprehensive consulting services tailored to meet your specific requirements. Whether you need fully managed or co-managed IT services, our team is ready to help you. We specialize in supporting businesses that require IT administration or teams seeking an extra layer of support to enhance their operations. Our install team is ready to assist you with all of your structured cabling and Wi-Fi planning needs as well. To learn more about any of our services, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out the Hire Us form, and let us start crafting the perfect IT solution for you. If you want to show some extra love for our channel, check out our swag store with shirts, hats, dust accessories, and more. We also have affiliate links down below that'll get you discounts and deals on products and services we talk about on this channel. With the ad read out of the way, let's get you back to the content that you came here for. Now, several years ago when the Pi KVM first came out, it was one of the first keyboard video mouse setups that worked over the web that was somewhat affordable. And people even complained then it was very expensive, but they clearly weren't looking at what the commercial companies were offering. So I really like that project and I think kickstarted all of us down the path of affordable KVMs being within grasp, within reach. And then came the Jet KVM, which is actually really close in size to the GLI KVM. But this one in particular was on Kickstarter and I thought it would be, well, something that never actually materialized. Even though they sent me one for review, I backed the project with my fingers crossed and hoped because the review unit works so well that it would be something that shipped and here it is an available product. Well, I'm not going to get into the details of tariffs, but tariffs have caused some problems of shipping these to the U.S. as of right now in April 2025. Hopefully you're watching this in the future where all those problems are just resolved. Hopefully. Back to the point here, inexpensive sub $100 KVMs I think are a really important category, but of course, do they work? And I think the standard is set, in my opinion, by this little Jet KVM for something that works really well. I can get into a BIOS setup screen. It boots fast. It has just a really nice usable interface. And of course, with the usable interface being, well, buggy, as Apple Large Venture pointed out, he was absolutely right that if you can't get into the BIOS and I can't get it to like Linux, then it suddenly loses a lot of its utility. And of course, I was puzzled when the ATX connector didn't work and realizing I just had to flip the polarity because of the way they engineered the chips on here. It expects the power to be flowing in a particular direction in order to actually make this work. And by the way, there are some physical buttons on this, and this requires that to be powered and the player to be right for the physical buttons on here to work because the physical buttons don't actually do the little momentary contact. They activate the little chips on here. So that is some clarification for anyone that might be having trouble with that. And hopefully that helps. Back to this little device here. I wish it was PoE. It's not. That's the one spot I think they missed, but in the sub $100 category, hard to find any of these that are PoE, but we do have standard USB power, one standard RJ45 connector, HDMI in, a dedicated port for the keyboard video mouse, and what is labeled as a USB 2.0 port. And this is where we connect a USB 2.0 over to the ATX adapter and it shows up in the UI. So hardware wise, pretty clean and simple device. Now when the device boots up, it gets an IP address. You go to that IP address and the first thing you're prompted with is setting a password. 
Once you set the password, you can log in. I like that it doesn't have a default password. I like that it forces you to set a password on first time use. I think that's a good security practice. I also like that the interface itself is secured with HTTPS. This is something that with the Jet KVM was commented on that, yeah, it does not currently ship with HTTPS out of the box, at least not with the current firmware. And I'm not positive because of the lower powered chip that's in it, whether or not that will be a future feature or not. But this does have that. I didn't see anything in here about loading certificates, but I will mention that if you go in here and you go to the toolbox, you can get to the terminal. You can also SSH in, port 80, port 443, and port 22 are open. The password for root will be the same password that you set when you set the device up. And the terminal access just logs you right in and you can see things that are running on here. You can see the chip, et cetera, and all the different services running. Of course, it's just running Linux under the hood. Firmware updates. Those were really simple to do. We go over here to the firmware, and I want to point out what firmware I'm using because that matters quite a bit. This is the version 1.1.0 release 2. It did ship with a beta firmware when I got it, and after a few days, this firmware came out. Matter of fact, I don't know if it was today or yesterday that this came out, but it is currently April 22nd of 2025, and this is the firmware I'm running. Up here, we have the security. We can add 2FA. thought that was a nice touch, and we have the option to reboot or log out and then a full screen. I like the full screen option because once the bar fades away here, and we'll close this one too, the side one, I'm connected to this Linux instance, which is just a machine I have over on my bench running Pop! OS. It gives me a nice clean screen. The uh, updates time in terms of refresh is really good. So it is a nice high quality stream. I'm not sure how much YouTube might mangle this and make it not look as good. Also, sound support is there via the HDMI. So I can pipe the audio all the way through to my computer. Of course, this is a local network. It's actually working quite well. And to get out of full screen, we're just gonna hit the escape key. It's not going to send that over, but you do have the ability to show the virtual keyboard. If you needed to hit keys, that would interfere with your system when you're using it. So the virtual keyboard is an option as well. And when we go over here to toolbox, we have the ability to control delete, win L, win space, control shift. So you don't have to do that. There's not any way that I noticed to have sticky keys on this, uh, but that would be a nice option if it did. I was playing one of my YouTube videos here in the background and it plays perfectly fine. Like I said, you can completely watch YouTube over this. Not that I recommend it. You can sell it's going to be less than perfect. I know it's a little blurry and it's actually a YouTube thing because it's catching up on the resolution. Let's uh, fix that here. Bump up the resolution. There we go. And you can see you can actually amazingly watch a video over it. So it works pretty well. This is, this is nice in terms of the video quality you get out of it. Another question people may have is, you know, I've got the quality settings on ultra high. I should minimize this altogether. Uh, you can also dynamically change this. So let's bump it all the way up to 3840-2160. And I'll show you what happens here. Uh, this works fine in Windows, by the way. I'm doing it in Linux because that was one of the challenges it had before. It's going to take a second to update the screen at this high of a resolution because it's got to now shrink it down. This is only capturing it a little bit lower of a res here. There we go. And once again, it's a little small to read, but uh, you can see it working here and it's able to do really high resolutions on here. I'm going to set it back down. They also have a couple options here if you want a no sound version of them. Not sure if that's something you need, but uh, that's an option. We're going to bump down the resolution. We also have the ability to change the orientation or just disable the audio. It's going to take a second to refresh on there. Now, the App Center was empty until the latest update, or at least I didn't see it when I first got it. Uh, Tailscale is the only app in here. I haven't really tested it, but it does prompt you to sign into your Tailscale account, and then you can control the remotely with Tailscale. I think that's pretty cool. And under accessories, we have the ATX Power. I'm assuming it's the only accessory right now available for this that I've seen. Maybe there's a future where they have other things, but pretty simple. I do not have it connected to ATX on this particular board because it's a little mini PC. And you get a long press, a short press, and a restart option. As I noted, make sure the polarity is correct so it works on your board. Now let's talk about virtual media. I've got it uploading here, a Debian 12. And yeah, it's painfully slow. They did not use fast memory for this. It'll eventually get done in another minute. Just upload this ISO. I'll go ahead and cancel it. I just wanted to show you just how painfully slow that is. It's slow to read, slow to write. 
And uh, and you have the option to delete and remove these. But man, this is not great. This is where I think there was just a big miss. They chose really slow memory for this. They also chose very little memory for this. I was hoping I could do something like maybe use the accessory port where the USB 2.0 is, pop in a USB and it would mount it or something. Maybe hint, hint in the future if GLI is watching this, that'd be a cool feature. If not, use something such as a Ventoy set up for your system where you plug it in because you can get in the BIOS and tell it to boot from it. Uh, just leave that plugged into the system you're connecting remotely with it because the virtual media is there, but not particularly useful. Kind of a big miss, in my opinion, for ISO storage, but is what it is. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is these little buttons down here at the bottom. If I mouse over them, it says stream is active, keyboard captured, mouse is free, and now the mouse is going to be free based on whether or not it's actually hovering over this. But the status and active, really important, because if I were to yank out the HDMI cable, what happens is the last image will stay on the screen. It will not tell me in the screen that the HDMI has been disconnected. So if you were to just suddenly power off the system that this is plugged into, it would be frozen on that screen. Now, something else worth noting, and this is true of many KVMs, and the Jet KVM is one of them that I really held to a high standard because it worked so well, is you get a keyboard connection before you get a display. Therefore, you're going to be able to hit the delete key. Now, the Jet KVM almost instantly gives me a display, so I'm able to hit keys to get in the BIOS. This one's not bad. It's relatively close, so I'm able to get into the BIOS. If you notice, it blinked by pretty quick. But because the keyboard's active before, all you have to do is keep mashing that key, and the keyboard commands do get there, even if the video hasn't synced up yet. This seemed to vary a little bit from system to system. The new firmware makes it update way faster. It would not do this when I was going through the BIOS and some of the other machines when I very first got it. Uh, some of them worked, some of them didn't completely. It would be like, well, sometimes I'm going to display this boot screen. Other times I would just not display it, but you can always hit the keys and eventually land into the boot screen. And once you're in here, well, this particular one with the Think Center does support keyboard, video, mouse, but uh, others where it's just keyboard, I haven't had any problems since I got to this latest firmware. Now, the GLI Comet KVM does run Linux, but of course, you want to know more about that code that runs it, and they claim it's open source. Well, good news is it's open source now, and this is something I want to highlight that I think is a direct result of people such as Apple Arch Adventure calling them out going, hey, you seem to be missing some code, and here all the code is only a few days later, four days ago, this was committed and updated. This is based on the Pi KVM, and I think they did a nice job of thanking the Pi KVM for contributing this. They forked it, kind of did their own thing, added their own UI on top of it. But yes, nice to see that all the source code is available. That's something that should have been done prior to sending them to some of the YouTubers. So, you know, we will certainly call you out on that if you're a company that doesn't do it. Here is all the code. It's available right now on GitHub here on April 22nd of 2025. Now, as I said earlier, this was sent to me as it was to many other creators and all opinions are my own. They had no editorial influence over this, no money exchange hands between me and the GLI net company, but I did interact with them asking about the problem with this. By the time they emailed me back, I'd actually already heard that it was a polarity issue from AppAlert and well, that's how I resolved that problem was by flipping it around, as I mentioned, and did email them to hopefully put it into the documentation. Overall, I think it's a pretty good value. These are supposed to be shipping in mid-May 2025 for a price of $79, including shipping, and $90.90 for the ATX adapter, which does come with both full and half-height adapter. I think if you need to power something on or off, this is not that much more to get. So uh, yeah, pretty good price on that. Overall though, how does it compare to the Jet KVM? I like the display. I like the $69 price tag because, well, it's less and that seems reasonable. But as I mentioned earlier, and hopefully you're watching in this in a future where all the problems of shipping are solved and this is available again in the US. So this is probably going to be a pretty popular sub $100 KVM option. I hope that they come out with some more accessories in the future. Right now, the only thing you can plug into it that I'm aware of is this. And it would be kind of neat though, if they had some type of switching unit where they can split the HDMI and control maybe a series of other devices so I can have it hooked up to more than one. This is something that you can actually do with the Pi KVM. There's a, another device that lets you hook it up to several systems. It'd be cool if they expanded and got more into that. So wink, nod, hint, hint. Uh, if they're looking for an opportunity to make another device to add on to this. And if you want to send one, well, you guys already got my address over there at GLI. So, hey, I'll, I'll test one of those if you send it. 
Now I want to hear from you. What do you think of this little device? Is it a good value? Leave those thoughts and comments down below. Like, subscribe to see more content from the channel. Like, subscribe to my friend Applar channel. He's got a lot of great videos, not just the one on this. Of course, he did do a deep dive on it. You should probably check out if you want to see this thing taken apart or you want to see the results of his Wireshark testing. Nothing too suspicious, but you know, he's got some commentary on there that's very interesting. He's done it before with actually several other devices. So go ahead and check his channel out as well. You can hit me up in the forums, forums.lord systems.com. You can also connect with me on the socials at lawrencesystems.com. All right, and thanks.